inner voice. My story. My life. In South Africa. In Kenya. South Sudan. Hear Africa's voices. A way of understanding the world. A dog to the soul. In Africa. In Africa. In Africa. CNN African Voices. Hi, I'm Chachi, a comedian from Kenya. <laughs> Hear my story. African Voices, Sunday on CNN. In association with GLOW. Innovators, influencers, they've reached the top and are today's leading women. Inspiring individuals sharing their insights on CNN. This month, she's a modern-day beauty queen and heiress to the Lauder Empire. And she's leading the charge in the cutthroat world of advertising. They share what it takes to build your own brand. You have to be brave. You have to stand up for yourself. Don't be shy. Leading Women, Wednesday on CNN. In association with Omega. It's life in the fast lane, in the car, and off the track. Stay ahead of the pack with The Circuit on CNN. Track the business behind the billions fueling the sport and keep up with Formula One. The drivers, the legends, and the technology that makes race day happen. Gear up for the Belgian Grand Prix. Visit cnn.com slash motorsport now in association with DHL. I'm Ben Wiedemann in Rome, and this is CNN. This is CNN. I'm Jim Clancy, and here are your headlines. Several dozen of the more than 200 Russian aid trucks that had crossed into Ukraine have now returned to Russian territory, that according to state media. It is not known if they delivered their supplies of humanitarian aid. An official in Ukraine called sending the trucks into his country an invasion. There's been a deadly attack on the Iraqi interior minister's uh, intelligence headquarters in central Baghdad. A suicide bomber struck, killing at least two people and wounding 10 others. We understand that the attacker drove up to the gate of the complex and detonated his explosives. This next story out of Iraq contains video that for some will be quite disturbing. It was taken during a horrific mass killing at a Sunni mosque in Iraq's Diyala province. Gunmen shot to death at least 70 worshippers and then wounded at least 17 more. Sunni lawmakers are blaming Shia Muslim militias. Israel's military says it struck 20 targets inside Gaza early Saturday. A spokesman says at least six rockets and mortar shells were fired into Israel from Gaza overnight. Palestinian medics say an Israeli airstrike on a house early Saturday killed five family members, including two children. Those are your headlines. I'm Jim Clancy. Stay with us. The Best of Quest starts right now. On Quest Means Business this week, social media sites are forced to make some tough decisions in light of an appalling atrocity. Richard Branson offers to intervene personally to resolve the Russian-Ukraine crisis. And what a shower. We pour cold water on Richard Quest, all in a good cause, of course. This is the best of Quest. Hello, I'm Maggie Lake, in for Richard Quest. The abhorrent video showing the murder of James Foley by ISIS extremists has left YouTube and Twitter struggling with their biggest ethical challenge yet. And they've had little choice but to respond to questions which go straight to the heart of free speech debate. Just where do you draw the line between basic human dignity and, to quote the phrase, the right to know? The video, which we are not showing, was uploaded to YouTube with the link retweeted on Twitter. Here's what they they said in response. YouTube says YouTube has clear policies that prohibit content like gratuitous violence, hate speech, and incitement to commit violent acts. And we remove videos violating these policies when flagged by our users. YouTube added that it suspends accounts linked to terrorists. Twitter says that it's suspending accounts to prevent the spread of the footage of James Foley being killed. Either way, action can only be taken retrospectively once content is is uploaded. At CNN, content goes through comprehensive editorial approval before it's put on air. CNN's Jonathan Mann explains why CNN won't broadcast the video. 
Islamic State militants have released a graphic video that shows the beheading of U.S. war journalist James Foley. When an innocent non-combatant is executed in cold blood by the most threatening extremists in the Middle East, it's murder and it's news. The news media have been telling the world about the fast-moving ISIS military campaign, its killings and kidnappings. But what should we do when an atrocity is staged for the images it will generate and the victim is a colleague? It's news that James Foley, a brave reporter who wanted to tell important stories, died trying. It's news that the executioner's accent may offer a hint about his identity. It's news that may change what governments and armies do next. It's news that other journalists will spread and that social media will spread without any journalists involved, no matter what we do. It's news that extremists wanted us all to spread and they killed a man, at least in part, so that we do it. What should we do? We thought about it, and we hope we made the right choice. The extremists shouldn't win today. The victim, James Foley, should be remembered. We're not broadcasting ISIS video at all. We are broadcasting a brief audio excerpt because of that accent. We're identifying Foley most often with photos taken before he fell into his captor's hands. We're trying to do exactly and only what we need to do. We report the news. Soon after the video was posted online on Tuesday night, one of James Foley's cousins tweeted, don't watch the video, don't share it. That's not how life should be. Senior media correspondent Brian Stelter and former head of public policy at Google and CEO of Dig, Andrew McLaughlin, joined me to discuss the role of social media. There are matters of taste. There, there are matters of what is appropriate for uh, uh, all audiences to see from young to old. And one of the things I noticed about Twitter yesterday when this news first broke was that if you searched Jim Foley's name, the first result was a picture of what had happened after the execution, mm -hmm. uh, a picture that we would never even show on television. Uh, I don't think even blurred we would show it. So that uh, is an example of the very different standards we're talking about. What is the criteria? What's the dialogue happening here? here for social media companies in regard to an event like this? So the dilemma for Twitter is that three things are in tension. The first is it's an open platform mm -hmm. uh, where they want people to share news and feel free to express themselves. And by any measure, the events, the horrible events um, in, uh, uh, in Iraq, uh, in Syria recently, um, are news. They're newsworthy. The second tension is the very human sympathy that anybody would feel, Brian calls it decency, you might call it compassion for the family and the friends uh, of James Foley. And any group of humans running a company like Twitter will feel um, uh, that kind of um, pull to be decent and to try not to accelerate or, or to kind of deepen the um, pain of the family. Mm -hmm. The third tension here though, which I think is interesting, is that likewise nobody wants to give to uh, the murderers in this case, the propaganda victory that comes with the widespread of the, vic uh, of the video. Uh, we heard uh, James Foley's cousin tweet, nobody should be sharing this mm -hmm. thing. Nobody should be talking about mm -hmm. uh, my now dead cousin in that way. And I think what Twitter has done is actually quite defensible in this case. If you think about the case of Michael Brown in Missouri mm -hmm. or more recently uh, Eric Garner in Staten Island um, who was killed uh, in a police chokehold, um, families have very different reactions to the deaths of their relatives, depending on context. Um, here, we see terrorists attempting to provoke shock, and so the natural instinct is to deny them uh, that uh, propaganda victory. In Missouri and Staten Island, what we saw were people um, killed through arguably an abuse of power, and the documentation of that moment is something the family wants everyone to see in order to share in the outrage. This, is, this, uh, this means that, that these companies, and, and traditional media included, are being asked to weigh in on politics, though, aren't they? They are. We saw we also, Twitter. We may not be a platform, but some we of the say we want to cover both sides and give uh, the information, not pass judgment. YouTube as well. You know, YouTube owned by Google was where this video was originally uploaded. Uh, the video was taken down. Duplicates were quickly taken down. But there are always going to be other places online to find this content. One of the West's best known entrepreneurs makes a heartfelt plea to President Putin. After the break, we hear from Richard Branson on how the East and West can work together. Let's try to get this sorted uh, by um, negotiation and, and not by force.
Brazil. The good news. Bahrain allows 100% foreign ownership, giving us total freedom to operate. The other good news. Total freedom plus our team's sales genius means we've beaten our quarterly targets. The bad news? There is no bad news. Best wishes, Zhou Tan, Sales Director, Huawei, Bahrain. Fact, the Gulf's most liberal business environment has been built in Bahrain. Bahrain, built for business. means business, we've given extensive coverage to the economic deep freeze between East and West. We found it's been hard to gather comment from multinational CEOs, and it's not surprising given they're in a difficult position when it comes to expressing a view. That's why it raised eyebrows when we heard Richard Branson has offered to step in to the fray, along with the leaders of 15 other companies. These are firms with plenty at stake, such as Unilever, PayPal, and eBay. I asked the Virgin Group boss why he felt he needed to get involved. I just uh, think it's extremely sad to see uh, in my lifetime the Berlin Wall coming down and then uh, a number of years later um, all, all that hope seem seemingly disappearing and I have a lot of Russian friends, a lot of Ukrainian friends, a lot of uh, business leaders from both countries um, and I've spoken with them and they're, they're equally sad and um, you know we felt it was important to uh, speak out uh, to uh, beg our politicians to, uh, you know, through diplomacy to resolve this particular issue, and then as quickly as possible to try to uh, get back to uh, the no normality that existed between Russia and Europe and the rest of the world after the Berlin Wall came down. Um, and, the, you know, what, if, if that does not happen, we, we, we fear that we'll go right back into the Cold War situation of the past and and all the misery that 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 uh that that, that, that was bestowed upon russian people um you know during those years and um and it's not not a win-win for anybody are you hoping to speak to vladimir putin himself and if so what makes you think this group can succeed where heads of state have thus far failed well the, the First important thing um, that's happening is that the president of Ukraine is meeting um, with President Putin next week, and let's hope that something positive comes out of that. Um, if that fails, then um, the, the group of people that we've put together, uh, the group of Russian business leaders, would be delighted to meet up with President Putin um, and see whether um, a compromise could be reached, uh, the, the group of Ukrainian business leaders that um, we have on board would be delighted to sit uh, with the Ukrainian president. And I think we could use our negotiating skills, our entrepreneurial skills to, um, you know, to, to, to reach a compromise. Uh, the Ukrainian and Russian business leaders who have joined you in the, this effort have taken a risk. The business community has been reluctant to speak out. What are they telling you? I must have spoken to about 100 uh, Russian business leaders, um, most of whom were not willing to speak out, but all of whom uh, want to see us uh, turn the clock back a year or two. Uh, you know, the, the last thing they want uh, is, is a, it's a horrible war. Um, now, the Russian leaders that have put their name to this uh, are significant people in Russia. They're the, they're the largest uh, mobile retailer, they're the largest restaurateur, they're the largest car dealer, largest food distributor, and so on. They're all self-made people. Um, and they're basically just saying to President Putin, you know, um, you know, let's let's try to get this sorted uh, by um, negotiation and, and not by force. Is Vladimir Putin someone you can do business with? Do you think he's open to diplomacy? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that um, you know, we, we, we would 
be irresponsible if we didn't give it a try. Um, and um, I think that uh, he feels uh, that, um, you know, when he got reelected, uh, the West didn't welcome him into office, that he was somewhat ostracized by the West. Um, and, and, and therefore, he's going it alone somewhat. And I think that what, what, whatever, what, whatever, you know, whatever caused him to feel that um, is up to the West, I think, to um, make it clear that we want Russia to be, you know, ultimately, we want Russia to be part of Europe. We want to be able to trust each other uh, completely. And, and, and that's what we've all got to try to work towards and, and, and try to put the last year um, firmly behind us and, 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 um, and, and, and try to find a positive way forward. Generally, heads of state are known for poise and grace under pressure. In Argentina this week, a visibly shaken president took to the airwaves calling on her country to disregard a court order from America, which prevents it from paying debts. President Christina Kirchner was emotional as she proposed legislation to allow some creditors to swap out defaulted bonds for new notes that would be governed under Argentine law. Excuse me, I am a little nervous. I usually have more poise. However, I really feel that we are living a moment of great injustice in Argentina. Well, it didn't go down well with one of Argentina's holdout creditors, Aurelius Capital. Its statement said Argentina's leaders have literally chosen to be outlaws. Contrary to government rhetoric, the only conspiracy harming Argentina's economy is composed of the nation's own leaders. Charles Dallara was one of the negotiators when Greece was dealing with bondholders a few years ago. He says Argentina is heading the wrong way. If Argentina continues to move away from what is the ultimate solution here, which is negotiated cooperative solution. Mm -hmm. You know, they created a rather difficult situation for themselves over a decade ago with a very confrontational unilateral approach. Many creditors accepted it, even though their arms were twisted. Some did not. Today, it's pretty clear that the inexorable flow of court decisions has put Argentina and its economy in a corner. Inflation is approaching 40 percent, Maggie. Mm. The country has moved into another recession, mild so far, but likely to intensify. I think Argentina needs to step back, not swap harsh language with its creditors. I would discourage both of them from that and see if they couldn't quietly sit down and find a negotiated solution. I, I just want to stand for one minute. They've called them vulture funds, hedge funds. These are not sort of your average bondholders or another governor company. These are people who specialize in distress. Should they do more to come to the negotiating table as well without knowing all the details? You're not involved in this negotiation, but it takes well, two sides to negotiate, doesn't it? It does, but I think pejorative language is probably not going to help either side at this point. I think that the creditors have indicated their willingness to negotiate. Mm -hmm. They're unlikely in the end of the day to get 100, 100 cents on the dollar, and I think they know that. But, you know, my own experience in Greece and many other restructurings over the years has demonstrated that ultimately these holdouts will not block a cooperative solution if all parties really want to find one. Argentina still has the cash to settle this, but their reserves are dwindling, and yeah. I think their time is running out on them. Interesting. Let's talk about other negotiations, the situation in Ukraine and Russia. We just heard Richard Branch calling for the business community to get more involved, negotiate. Um, should people be wary of investing in Europe right now, given the geopolitical backdrop? Well, I think people should be wary of investing in the former Soviet Union. I would not generalize that more broadly mm -hmm. to Europe. Of course, Europe is struggling with two clouds over its horizon. Now, one, the economic cloud, which shows that the recovery is not taking hold, as many had anticipated earlier this year. Maggie, growth is very weak throughout the continent. And then there is the second cloud of the Ukraine, Russia, and the tensions associated with that, as well as the sanctions. I do think and my firm, Partners Group, thinks there are still interesting selective investment opportunities in Russia. One has to be careful because mm -hmm. European markets, like American markets, have a good bit of liquidity jostling around in them. <laughs> but I think that one can find selective opportunities in Europe today, notwithstanding the fact that the economic outlook remains rather weak. After the break on The Best of Quest. <laughs> Richard gets ready for a soaking all in the name of charity. Expect facial expressions you've never seen before. And the Max Eisenbud, the driving force between brand Sharapova in reading for leading.